It's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be much mistletoeing and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It is officially my favorite time of the year. It is. It's where I'm still eating leftovers from last week. I love it. <laughs> wow, you are a lightweight, man. I finished those bows suckers off that night. Yeah, I, I, I finished them Friday. They call it, uh, here in the States, they call it Black Friday, right, with all the sales and everything. Yeah, yeah for me, it's just uh, it's just turkey part two. Yes. It's, well, uh, for, for those of you who are outside the States, you also call the day before Black Friday Thursday. We call it Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. I'll tell you, in this open that we do oftentimes as we get ready to, yeah. to record our audio podcast you play some fun word games with food uh -huh. i'm going to so i'll just share my comfort food this time of year it's so gross but we, we grew up very poor and so these things to me are still awesome but do you know what sandwich spread is no yeah so i don't know if this is like a northwest thing or just like a, a poor person thing or whatever yeah. but sandwich spread is like this just little jar of like mayonnaise with sort of like a pimento relish inside of it not like tartar sauce Piment like you we have pimento cheese yeah no cheese no okay. cheese it's it's just kind of like a tangy mayonnaise almost you with little green throw and red it on things in bread it. and eat that yep so i grew up that's what it was it would be like the cheap uh we had a store out here the cheap store where mart so what where mart bread and sandwich spread we ate would you, wait, we, i'm sorry would you put cucumbers on it because that actually sounds like that might be okay with cucumbers it might be i've never done that actually oh. but it is amazing with turkey so that's like my go-to next uh, so friday yeah some cheap just cheap bread are sandwich there, spread leftover are turkey. there companies that sell this stuff or do you have to mix it up and make it at home oh no they sell it like it's all the all the mayonnaise companies make make them like i think it's a relatively common not available in the south i have never heard of this before in my life Ever. So there you go. Here's our first thing down in the comments. If you know what sandwich spread is, let's unite in our gross f comfort food flavors. I've got I've got a, a local food uh, where I'm from that sounds awful and is actually pretty delicious. Jeff, have you ever had a Kentucky hot brown? I have not. A Kentucky hot brown. Is this that this is a family food. pod? This is a family show. Yes. Before you. <laughs> It sounds like you're eating a big old pile of dookie. Right. Uh, no, but basically what it is, is it's a piece of bread. The thicker, the better. Big old piece of Texas toast if you can. Okay. It's just, it's a piece of bread and you can put, um, usually I think ham is the best, which but like just a slice of ham, slice of turkey, something like that. on. Then you usually put like a tomato on top of that. And then depending on how you make it, depending on who your chef is or whatever, you put like a hollandaise sauce on, or you just throw some cheese on top mm -hmm. of it. And you just throw it in the oven or you you cook it like in a skillet and put the lid on the the, the cover on it so it all gets melty and stuff mm -hmm. just serve that up on a plate really basically it's, huh. it's a piece of toast with a piece of meat uh, you usually it's a tomato whatever kind of uh, it, it's really a hollandaise sauce like if you want to get fancy with it yeah and then and then uh, you put some cheese or or whatever on top and kentucky and it, hot brown it's called a kentucky hot brown yeah all right yeah try that out yeah yeah look for it look for it next time you're out kentucky hot brown. yeah they're um the the thing the thing with a hot brown is if you don't make it right it can be incredibly bland okay and just very flavorless yeah but if toast you, and ham right Little yeah bit. yeah but if well especially if you put turkey on it yeah because there's nothing to nothing. turkey you know i mean you could have like some salt on it or something but if you if you like you get like a good garden fresh tomato and and you know you put the right kind of butter in the pan before you put the stuff in and, and you make it the right way it can be hmm. quite delicious quite delicious my grandmother always also used to make potato cakes yes Did you ever yeah. have potato cakes totally which is totally. just it's just mashed potatoes mm -hmm. smushed together and then like fried into like a little yeah. piece right mm -hmm. yeah delicious anyway with that uh hey speaking of food uh you guys out there are about to watch Jeff and I record a podcast on the season four, episode 10, Racing Mars of Babylon 5. What you guys are here about to watch is the behind the scenes footage of how we do that. This is how the turkey is roasted. 
This is how the cranberry sauce is pureed. By the way, I make my own cranberry sauce. I have for the last couple of years. It is the best stuff I've, I like. Mm. I like cranberry sauce. Get that crap in a can. I love that crap in a can, but get it's that good, out of here. No. Do you put any like jalapeno or anything like that? No, I love spicy cranberry no. sauce. Oh, spicy. Ooh, I never thought about that. No, orange marmalade. Ooh, yeah. I, I You boil the cranberries and then you put the marmalade in. Uh, you can put some sugar in if you want, but the marmalade really does most of the sweetening. Yeah. And then you just boil it till the cranberries are popping, and then you you use a masher and mash them up, and then you you put it in the fridge for a couple hours and let it just kind of because mm. the like it'll automatically gel. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Oh, yeah. so good. Uh, anyway, uh, this is how the turkeys. Ro- this is how the cranberry sauce is pureed. This is how the potatoes are mashed. This is how your rolls are buttered. This is how. The turkey is stuffed. Jeff, do you do stuffing or dressing out there in Oregonia? I don't know what other people do. I have a very specific way I make turkey. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make too much about it, but it literally is the greatest turkey ever made. Uh. Um, we might talk about that afterwards. So okay, just, stay yeah, tuned. Maybe stay yeah. tuned. Anyway, uh, with that, this is how we do that. You guys are gonna see all the flubs, the behind the scenes stuff, the outtakes, everything that we get wrong because we ain't editing this crap and uh, you guys out there enjoy. But for those of you who want to hear the cleaned polished version that Jeff over there is going to make, uh, that'll be available on your local podcast feed available now as you guys are watching this. So Jeff, with that, why don't we get into this talking about racing Mars? Let's do it. You are valued and you are needed. You will be emperor. I think you're about to go where everyone has gone before. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And I'm Brent Allen, the one who will be. Doing okay, Brent? Yeah, I'm good. How good. are you going, Jeff? I'm great. Really? I am. I'm excited to talk about this one. Are you? I well, am because this, of us. Brent and I are watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you, the viewer and the listener, the one Ooh. who is. I'm trying. Hey, I'm trying, Brent. Here you go. Like, hey, Je- feeding it. Hey, listen, Jeff and I, we are, uh, we are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching this show for the very first time. And searching, though oftentimes we fail to find Star Trek-like messages that are being done in a uniquely Babylon 5 way. But one thing we do tend to do is bring in some Star Trek references into these conversations. So to keep us on point, focused on Babylon 5, we play The Rule of Three. This is one of our games that we love playing, which limits us to three. No more references a piece per episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. Just for clarity, we're only limited in Star Trek references. That is very true. We reference everything else as much and as often as we like. And we do. And we do. We very much do. One thing I love to reference Mm -hmm. are the five-star reviews that we have. Oh, yes. Got one right here from Apple Podcasts. Corman3000 says, perfect for rewatching with another perspective. With the remade high def B5 episodes available, this podcast is great for rewatching episodes. They have another perspective of the show that reveals subtle plot points that may have been missed the first five times I've watched the series. And it's hilarious when they try to predict the next episode. But sometimes. They nail the plot. Awesome. Got really close to nailing this one. Sure did. Hey, Mm -hmm. we have another five-star review. Oh, yes. Also from Apple Podcasts, John B's Pod People says, (laughs) it's a good name, good pod, clean language, Trek background. Sounds like a Yelp review. I like it. Good, Good pod, clean dialogue. Trek background. I have a whole pile of B5 DVDs and have been a fan since the 90s. 
After hearing about this podcast from another B5 pod, I decided to check it out. I'm starting from the first episode of their show, so I'm a little behind. Jeff and Brent have interesting observations, even as they bravely slog through season one. They keep it pretty clean, which also makes it unique, so it's okay to listen with kids in the room. Let the buzzer go, though, guys. I don't mind the Star Trek references, but that thing is distracting. <laughs> I did, uh, John B's pod people, I did that buzzer at you. Just, just for you, you, John. But I just still appreciate you. you. John, you're awesome. You're amazing. Jeff, you and I were talking just before we came on mic here about the idea of word economy mm -hmm. and managing managing all of that. So I appreciate that in so many ways. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, along with those reviews and along with our rule of three and along with giving out Delta Furies at the end of the episode, another thing we like to do is make predictions. I referenced mine just a moment ago. We make predictions about what we think the episodes are going to be about based on title alone. We have not previewed the episode. We have not seen next week on Babylon 5. We have not read descriptions. We've not even looked at thumbnails as long as we can avoid it. And we make a guess solely based on title alone. Jeff, do you remember what you said Racing Mars was going to be about? I figured we'd be heading to Mars, right? <laughs> with Franklin and Marcus on their way, we'd have the adventures with odd couple shenanigans with quite a bit played for laughs and some stuff kind of coming up along the way. We definitely had some stuff played for laughs on their way. I also thought that we were going to get a little more insight into what's going on with the Centauri. That did not happen mm -hmm. at all. What about you, Brent? What did you think? Well, I, I said that this was going to be Marcus and Franklin on their way to Mars. And when they got there, something bad was going to happen when they met the resistance. Check mark. I also said that Garibaldi was going to figure into this one uh, because as he's resigned command, he's given a bad interview for Sheridan that Sheridan is clearly not happy with. Things were going to get really awkward between Garibaldi and Sheridan, and they were going to have it out. Check mark. Uh, I also said that because Garibaldi was from Mars, this would result in him leaving the station, heading back to Mars, which did not happen, and that he would wind up swooping in and saving Franklin and Marcus at the very end uh, because that's where it seemed to me like this was going. So two out of three? It's pretty darn good. I'll take it. I'll take it two out of three. Well, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about and haven't seen this episode in a really long time or, or just to yourself, forgot it, just forgot it and thought to yourself, wait, Franklin and Marcus went to Mars. Like, when did that happen? Not the most memorable of episodes. Well, spoiler alert. I now I can't wait to dive into this. Hey, Brent, yes. why don't you walk us through racing Mars? Oh, well, where to begin with this one? I guess let's just start at the beginning, huh? Ivanova and Sheridan have a business meeting about the station, and at the end, Ivanova tells Sheridan to go take a nap. Meanwhile, Franklin and Marcus are playing a rousing game of I Spy on their way to Mars. And what do they find while playing this game? An actual spy! Okay, he's not really a spy. He's Captain Jack Sparrow! He plays coy, he plays stowaway, and he plays drug dealer with food. You know because he's offering the first one for free, but he's going to get them on the comeback. And more than that, but more than that, it turns out that he is the contact for the resistance that those two have been looking for. And he, Captain Jack Sparrow, gives them their fake IDs. And it turns out that Marcus and Franklin are posing as a newlywed couple on their honeymoon. Because who wouldn't want to go to a place like Mars for their honeymoon? <laughs> Super romantic, guys. Well, while they're completing the rest of their journey to Mars, let's go back to the station and check in on what's going on over there. Well, Sheridan, having been given a time to go nap, is not napping. And he's got a lot of time on his hands, and he's really starting to stew over that interview that Garibaldi gave with ISN. And Sheridan, just like yours truly predicted, goes to confront him it goes pretty much exactly the way you would think it would go it's a whole lot of hey man that wasn't cool oh yeah well you're not being cool either 
Well, just stop being a jerk. I'm not the jerk. You're the jerk. Nuh uh, uh huh, nuh uh, uh huh. At least no punches were thrown, though. And there were some definite creepy guys way over in the corner watching, and they would eventually approach Garibaldi to make him an offer he can't refuse. They don't exactly tell us what they're up to, but it seems pretty obvious they're trying to get rid of Sheridan. And while all that is happening, Ivanova is proving herself more than capable of handling the business of the station as she calls all the known smugglers together to make arrangements with them for all of them to go straight. And she provides a pretty cool win-win scenario to keep them on the straight and narrow and keep the station alive and running. All right, well, let's go check in on Mars. The happy couple is being treated to stories about how aliens are starting to swoop into Mars and trying to take over the planet and that the Mars colonies have been left to defend themselves. And the folks on Mars have no idea what's happening out there. Well, there's no really time to fill everybody in on exactly what all has been happening because it's time to actually meet the resistance. That is as soon as their identities have been confirmed, which of course they're not. And that's when stuff gets really weird. You see Captain Jack, he's, uh, uh, he's got a little itchy problem going on underneath his jacket there. And he tries to turn a PPG on the resistance leader, number one. But Marcus and the others are super fast and they shoot Captain Jack Sparrow and some parasite thing off of his shoulder. We later learn that that parasite thing actually has the ability to control minds. So Captain Jack wasn't really responsible for what he was doing. It sure as heck to me, Jeff, sounds like one of those little eyeball things that was on the neck of... Uh, Londo and the other Centauri Emperor guy. Uh, Regent not, McJokey, McJoker man. Yeah, yeah, jo yeah. Jokey McJokerson. Uh, although we didn't really see it flipped over, but that's that's what it seemed like to me. Now, with that, though, Jack has some news, though. You see, those things are like starfish. You can blow most of it off, but if just a little bit is left behind, it can actually regrow. And there's only one real way to deal with that, by going boom. And so... Jack makes himself go boom. And with that, Marcus and Franklin are in. But it's going to take a few more episodes, apparently, before we get to that story. Well, finally, back on the station, Delenn is being really creepy with John. She wants to have a bunch of folks stand right outside in the living room while he and her go discover each other's pleasure centers. And later, Sheridan and Garibaldi have it out one more time. This time, Garibaldi really does punch Sheridan straight in the mouth. And the episode ends with Garibaldi fully signing on to the creepy dudes who haven't really told us what they're up to yet. Jeff? What did you think about this episode, Racing Mars? Brent, I loved this episode. No, you did not. I did. You did not. Shut it was so much fun. You I did loved not. this. I False. did. False. You I totally did. did. Not. I, I just right out of the gate. I got. I. I. Is this season four's TKO? Where like the fandom is just like this is pure garbage. But Jeff Aikens over here, like I love this episode. No, it's this, so good. No, this is the season's delivery to Avalon. Man, doing. I had so much fun with this one. I loved Marcus and Franklin together. I loved Ivanova. Like telling Sheridan what was what and pulling people together. And like you said, getting that win-win situation for everybody. I love, I don't like how, but I love that Sheridan and Garibaldi are ramped up and the whole Delenn, that was, that was awful and amazing. I laughed. I freaked out. I even cried a little bit, sort of figuratively. It was really sad when Jack went, that was a moving moment. Mm. I thought the way that they played it. Um, I think it moved key parts of the story forward mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun. Like this was, this was the first episode in a long time that was just like, this is kind of fun. We've been so heavy and so serious for so long that I think this was a welcome break. What, are, let me ask you this. What have been the fun episodes? 
like soulmates soulmates was a fun episode soulmates um i'll say a late delivery from avalon like everything except like the go home part with him like his discovery of who he was but the whole yeah. stuff with garibaldi in the post office yeah. and the stuff when he was king arthur like that was yeah. it was meant for fun some of the gray 17 was mi is missing stuff well actually i don't think it was played for fun though it just was fun but it just was fun yeah a much better episode not... than the fandom puts out there agreed so, but I have to say this piece about this episode uh -huh. and I love it. So I have to believe that there was sort of a joke and some other stuff with the Marcus and Franklin being married. Okay. Piece. So it, it took me this, I think this is such a reflection on the time. It took me a significant amount of time in the episode to realize that this was being played for laughs. Like I thought the joke was that they didn't love each other and would never actually get married. I didn't see this as the subtle late nineties comment on gay marriage that it was to me. It was just like, of course they're going to be a married couple. And it's funny because they don't want to get married yeah. to each other. Like this hit so different in 97 than it did right now. Mm -hmm. I want to say this was like, this is, presciently written with layers. JMS like saw the future and wrote layers to this joke that in 97, ha ha, two dudes are going to be married. That's so funny. And then planting seeds. But then now almost in 2024, we're like, ha ha, two people that kind of don't want to ever love each other and might not even like each other have to be married now. What a comment that is on how far we've come in these 25 ish years since this episode aired. I thought that was pretty cool. The, um, the ability to use comedy to insert ideas into society. Brilliant is brilliant. And I, I, as a, as a former stand up comedian, I, it bothers me and I understand why it happens, but it bothers me when people write off comedy in a past era as being offensive because it seems like it's making fun of something when actually it's very clearly normalizing it for the, for the, for the folks of the time, you know, uh, and, and that's what it was trying to do. But in looking back on it 30 years later, people want to get all up in arms about it. And, uh, it, it was, it was, what was so brilliant about that was it was a, Hey, you guys are a newlywed couple on your honeymoon. And you're right. It turned in that they looked at each other just like, no, we're not married. I can and barely stand like plain I spy with you anymore. I'm done. Right. Um, switch genders and nothing about that scene had to change. Just put, 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 uh, uh, Franklin and Ivanova there. Mm -hmm. Put Sheridan and Ivanova there and they're calling each other. One of them's teasing the other by calling them honey. And the other one's like, ah, what, you know, what are you doing? Like it was, but the idea that it wasn't like, oh, we're gay. It, yeah. It wasn't it was like, dude, like, it's gross. It, it was more like a, I gotta be you, to what you said. I gotta be married to you yeah. to insert. That was such normality in 1997 and do it under the guise of comedy in the, the world that was 1997 is it's just brilliantly done. I, I very much appreciated that piece. Um, for that. Yeah. Like it was just funny how, how it took me like, you know, they played the joke. Here's your identity cards. Here's the stuff. And I'm just watching. And then Marcus is kind of poking some fun. I'm watching. And then later on, I think it was when they were in the train, like in the train thing, joking with each other, choking with each other. I was like, Oh, that's right. This used to be, this used to be funny. <laughs> like this very normal, very normal, healthy thing used to be a joke. Oh my gosh. Sorry. I didn't realize. Well, Hey, how about for the, one of the shortest parts of this episode, Brett, what did you think of this episode? <laughs> All right. That's thanks. my full thought. No, you know what? Listen, last week was awesome. I yeah. truly enjoyed last week. This week was so drawn out. And to me, this week wound up committing the ultimate sin. It was kind of boring. What? It was boring. This episode was weird. 
I really wish that I had actually fully nailed the prediction with Garibaldi showing up just in the nick of time on Mars to save everybody because that would have been a better episode. Your prediction, Jeff, of let it be an odd couple on the way and let it dive, embrace the comedy and mm -hmm. make it a comedy episode. That would have been a better episode. This was just drawn out. This was one of those episodes where very little to nothing was wrapped up. This was an episode that to me, I feel like probably serves a point. It serves a purpose in the overall story and narrative. It's a, it's a, it's a chess pieces moving episode. We're just going to move the pieces. Nothing's really going to happen. We're just going to move some pieces around. You know, we're going to introduce you to a couple of new characters here. We're going to set some stuff up. Uh, but nothing, I mean, the whole ending and resolved of, of Marcus and Franklin of like, Hey, so yeah, we got your ID confirmed. Uh, but it's going to take a few days for the rest of the resistance folks to get here. So that's where we're going to end for today. Like, like, that's what it felt like. I'm reading my kid a story and like, we get to the end of the chapter and go, okay, that's where we're going to end for tonight. Because like, no, that's, I want to read more. I, yeah. Like we haven't finished. That's the way I feel about this episode. We just, we haven't finished. There were some elements that were funny. I'll give mm -hmm. you that. But as overall, I just, I personally didn't care for this episode at all. Is there a part of this episode that you did care for that we want to dive into first? I love how long it's taking for you to not, even think. No, not I mean, Jeff, you what, listen, I'm going to dump all over this episode if you let me lead this conversation. So, well, you, let's do I, this. I've got, listen, I have, let's hear one, two, three, four. I have eight notes. Wow. I normally have like 30 something. Yeah, I have a whole lot more than that. Yeah. So I think we can quick, quick through a couple of these, right? Okay. The Ivanova thing. Awesome. Yeah. That was cool. Um, what, my favorite Although thing. I, I, oh, let's go ahead. I was my two favorite things with her, uh -huh. one with her and then one follow up was just her telling Sheridan to take a break. Take a break. It's beautiful. Let's go away. She was upstate. peak, peak first yeah. officer. Like she was great. And then my favorite piece there when Sheridan's like, oh, I got the day off. Let me watch some TV. And apparently the adult channel is unavailable <laughs> in Babylon 5 right now. <laughs> you can get the news. But you can't get your grown-up stuff. Yeah. Um, I loved I loved Ivanova coming in and telling him, "Hey, listen, it it made all the sense in the world. You go do this." Um. I I feel like there could have been a little more needling, like kind of that we've been talking a little bit lately about missing the old school season one of Ivanova. Mm -hmm. There could have been a little bit more of that in this. But what I loved about it was when she was there left with the station, they're all like, Hey, look, we got two months left of supplies. If we don't, if something doesn't happen, stuff's going to start getting off in a bad way. And while Sheridan is off taking his mandated time off, uh, Ivanova's handling business. Yeah. And she set something up that I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out for him, but it's something. And she made it a win-win situation. She did what she needed to do. And basically it sounded like she was building her own NASCAR fleet. We're going to exactly. soup up your engines. Yep. We're going to get you going. We're you're going to you're going to outrun any transport guard that's out there. We're going to make this happen. We're going to do it all for free. Just bring us our stuff and keep it legal. She basically did if the mafia was running NASCAR cuz she's like we'll take care of you. We'll fix you up, fix you up, soup you up. Also, if you don't, I will blow you up. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Now please bring us vegetables. Yeah, yeah, no, no dust, nothing right, like that. Right. Just parts and some food. Yes, that's that's what we really need here. Maybe some letters. That would. I loved how they used that to explain Garibaldi's hair, where apparently he got some something and that caused his hair to fall out. That was just a fun little. Okay, so uh, uh, he has been going more and more bald as the show has been going on, right? Well, he's following a tenant. One of my really good friends does, and he says, "If it won't grow, go low." And that has been the Michael Garibaldi approach to hair care. So my, my personal thing, um, is I have always said that if I start doing the male pattern baldness and thankfully that doesn't tend to happen in my family and I'm still praying that that holds true for me. But if it ever starts going that way, cause my, my stepfather is, I mean, male pattern baldness since he was 22, 
like yeah. crazy. But I've always said, if that happens to me, I am shaving my head for the rest of my life. Yeah. I have no qualms. I've got a, I've got a nice, beautiful bald head. It's so I, no qualms. I'm the, cause I've got, I've got, I mean, my hairline is receded from when this, this podcast started. I've got a nice shiny part here in the back that I've had for a long time. And so I tried that. I'm like, I'm going to shave. Yeah. I have, I'm a very, I'm a very sensitive person. It just happens that all of my sensitivity is in my skin. And so when I shave my head, I break out like a 12 year old kid and my, my head just becomes this, like this sea of acne. Oh no. And yeah. It is horrible. So, uh, going low is not an option for Jeff. Like I just got to like make the best out of what I got. Wow. Wow. Get you some Neutrogena for that thing, man. Right. It's <laughs> proactive. Sheridan and Delenn. Sheridan using his time off, and uh, Delenn takes him down uh, the the next of potentially forty seven rituals. <laughs> I mean fifty. I mean fifty, but forty seven. Said it takes fifty years for this to happen. I'm like, Delenn is not making this happen all the way through. There is no way that that's going to happen. Okay, first of all, this whole thing about having people stand outside and pray while you guys go discover your pleasure centers. This is not the first time I've heard of a culture that does this. Same. Now, usually it happens actually at the wedding night, mm -hmm. not beforehand. And it's more to make sure that things happen. Yeah. And we're mm -hmm. saying, because that's, that's, that's the when you're married. Like, you have the ceremony. Yeah. That's the union right there. Once mm -hmm. that happens... Now you're married, and that's when people celebrate. <laughs> is after that happens, which, man, if you could celebrate the first time your best friend goes out there and becomes a man <laughs> or a woman, go. depending on which side you're on, hey, go for it. I felt bad for Lanier though; like he had oh, to be out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Game of Thrones ish. Ooh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, uh. Dude, sit down in front, out in front of the king's quarters while he's whatever, you know, and his sister is supposed to. Anyway. Yeah, I felt like Mira Furlan, the act, like as yeah. an actor, was really having fun in this episode. Yes. Do you, know who, eyes... do you know who is not having a good day in this episode? Huh. Her makeup artist. The blending of her, that head bone into her skin is the worst blending I have seen in an episode since she had the full head crust. I feel like this whole season it's been her makeup's been not great. Her hair's been not great. Like, yeah, I don't know. And I haven't really wanted to comment it on it. Cause I don't, whatever, but you're right. Like it's been some pretty, when you have like a Londo or a Jakar who are like emoting and feeling yeah. through their makeup. And then you have a Delenn who it's like, I, I can see the powder. Yeah there i can see the line of the of the prosthetic right here like mm -hmm. and it, it's not blending like i can see where you tried to put the plastic on your face and it's not blending into the rest of your skin and and i mean uh, god bless them apparently they tried really really hard apparently it was like it was harder to do this version of makeup for delin than it was to do the full yeah Mimbari deal for her so uh, you know i'm not a makeup artist god bless those people but I just don't know how you get Jakar and the amazingness that is that. But then this other thing, which seems like it should be relatively easy. Yeah, comparatively. Yeah. I just, that so was I, one of my notes. The lens makeup is all over the place. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to Mars because I want to I want us to close on the Garibaldi conversation because that's I feel like is the heaviest well, meat. I, let well. me jump back to Delenn because I do want to okay. talk about that just for for brief, a brief second. How did you feel about the idea that Delenn was really wanting Sheridan to keep these outrageous ceremonies of her culture? You, you are in an intercultural marriage, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how did, how, like, did that strike you at all? Because he clearly was like, look, I'm not doing all of this. And she's like, please, it really means a lot to me. You do this stuff. You double up is what you do. I mean, and so to me, it's like a, for the way we did it, this is the Aiken approach to bringing intercultural relationships together is when you start, you do both. And then over time, you develop your own traditions from those things. 
I like I like to tell the story of our of our wedding and how. Um, so my my wife is Lebanese, and to understand that culture, you have to understand, and many of you probably do. So this is really focused to people in the United States who can't have a very hard time fathoming a culture in which religion is a core piece of of a society. Mm-hmm. In in Lebanon, you have Orthodox, you have Catholics, and you have Muslims, and they even have it set up where like their president, their prime minister, and somebody else are like they're their law says like the prime minister must be a Catholic. The president must be Orthodox and forget it. When I just remember it's the prime minister is a Catholic, a Maronite Catholic specifically. But so in our wedding, I'm Catholic. We've talked about that a lot. So we had a Catholic mass where we had a Muslim who did the readings. We had an Orthodox person who was cantering for us. And then the rest of the family who was Catholic doing things. And we had a Maronite priest con celebrating with the Roman uh, rite priest. So we kind of did both. At our reception, we had our dance, and it was a lot of just regular, you know, it's a wedding dance thing. But there's this awesome, fun dance they do in Lebanon or over in the Middle East called the Debki. And the Debki is like this whole, you you hold hands, it's a long string, and it's this rhythm, and you jump, and you leap. Mm -hmm. And there was this moment, because we had the DJ interweaving that stuff in, and we had like, 90 white people and 40 Arabs debking around the hall of this Catholic church. And it was like this magical moment where everything, it was so much fun. It was awesome. But Delenn is right to want to do this stuff. Sheridan is right, is right to want to do his stuff. And they, they both need to do them. I didn't think it was fair uh-huh. though, that she held that up against him. Yeah. I did your engagement ring thing. So you, you know, it's not a tit for tat. It's not right. that you have to like, Right. You have to do it because you want to do it. Yeah. I I was kind of in both places. Sheridan clearly did not want to do all of this stuff. It was clearly over the top. It also clearly meant a lot for Delenn. Well, I think what I said in my Brent Watches video for this week was they got to meet in the middle somewhere. They've got to figure out how to meet in the middle so that they can uh, come together on this. You know, and that mm-hmm. is going to be an important piece for them going forward because, as you said, uh, they're going to have differences, and that's okay. That's to be celebrated. And you're right. I like I like your rule. Do both, and over time, figure out the ones that you. I mean, honestly, I think that's the way my marriage pretty pretty much tends to work. I wouldn't necessarily call me and my wife uh, uh, interculture. You know, we're we're pretty homogenized, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> But even that, like just our holiday traditions in my family were different than her holiday traditions in her family. And when we first started dating, we did mine and hers. Mm -hmm. First couple years of marriage, we did both. And as time has gone on, we've kind of gone like it's a little of hers, a little of mine with a little new stuff of our own mixed in. And this is the holiday traditions we have now. These are the holiday traditions we have now. So, uh the biggest problem I had with Delenn in the in the ceremonies was Sheridan was clearly overwhelmed by it, mm-hmm. and there was too much, and she seemed insensitive to that. Yeah, I and that's where I had problems. I think with it more than anything. So, yeah. Well, I, what I know is a uh, is a Gen Xer who grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Like I, I like. There's a certain level of quiet, I guess you could say, that I'm accustomed to or whatever. You walk into a Lebanese or an Arab household, and that is not what's <laughs> happening. There are smells and sounds and things going on. That, little things, too, because it is so interfaith and interculture that like, yeah. oh, hi, it's nice to meet you, ma'am, who's a Muslim that I can't make physical contact with, but I don't know that. So like... Some people are very great, you know, gracious about that. Others not as much, but there has to be like a conversation of like, "Hey, John, uh, we're going to head into my quarters and we're going to do this thing, and there are going to be six people there watching." And well, like, on the other side of the door, theory, Ooh. yeah, who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, you, you got to prep. You got to prep the person because the other thing too is there's being along for the ride culturally. And then there's participating. And at this point, Sheridan is along for the ride and, and is looking around Mm -hmm. for a place to get off. 
of the ride. I don't know. It sounds looked to me yeah. like he enjoyed his ride pretty much. <laughs> looks around, he found it. He found and it. Lanier was kind of pissed about it. <laughs> and I took that personally. Right. <laughs> Woo hoo. Oh gosh. So in your recap, I loved your Captain Jack Sparrow reference. Mm-hmm. You know the one I was waiting for you to make? Which one? Harry Mud. <laughs> Captain Jack is totally Harry Mud. Except Harry Mud had a solid accent all the way through. <laughs> this guy had about five different accents that would intercut within the same sentence. Well, because he was being influenced by the keeper controller thing. Like uh, he was trying to sneak stuff through. It was squeezing his brain or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I found it fascinating uh, that the passphrase for the spy was Lita had a little Vorlon. Her skin was pale as snow and everywhere that Lita went, her Vorlon was sure to go. To me, that sheds a different light on Lita and Zach's conversation where she was like, I'm kind of weird, aren't I? And Zach's like, yeah, a little bit. Like you're, you're actually so weird that rangers who are undercover and just wearing their ranger pin out and open uh, tell nursery rhymes about you and your weirdo relationship with these people that tried to kill us. I thought that was pretty weird. I don't know. Did... Did Zach really say that to her? That she was a little weird? Yeah. But he didn't say yeah. anything about the about the ranger say that just, No, that I'm saying okay. I'm sa I'll yeah. just say, wait, did I miss something from that? I thought it was a brilliant like passcode yeah. phrase because only if you're from Babylon 5 are you going to understand Lita and, and the Vorlon. You're never going to and then you put it inside the Mary had a little lamb rhyme like Yeah, but which is what you use to stop Psychor from reading your mind. When you're a blip trying to run away. That is true. Uh -huh. Oh, I didn't make that connection until just this moment. Oh, that's cool. So when you think about Captain Jack and you think about him being compromised, uh -huh. what we know, because he talked about how they didn't know anything about the Shadow War or anything. So the words Lita and Vorlon probably mean next to nothing to him. Mm -hmm. And then it's a tune that we know can kind of get your brain slowed down. So maybe, but Keeper didn't quite pick up on all the stuff when it was trying to control him. Maybe. I loved. I love in the worst way. I hated it actually. This is this was Ben Zane quality stuff. Of uh, let me see if I can do it. <clears throat> That's far enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made the same joke on my Brent Watches video. I was like, this guy <laughs> is awful. Yeah, who so bad. Who cast this guy? Is this actually his voice or is he putting this on? Please tell me he's putting this on. This cannot be his real voice. I also love the way he looked at, looks at him because they're like, hey, we want to talk to whoever's in charge. And he goes, hey, I'm poop around here. <laughs> You're what? I mean, I'm number two. <laughs> I was just like a middle school kid. He's like, I'm number two around here. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. He said he's number two. It's funny. It's funny stuff. Was was did we have Austin Powers? Did did was Austin Powers a thing for what in 1997 when this episode came out? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, because he had number two in Austin Powers. Like I wonder if oh, it was yeah. a little, a little. Uh, I think we had an Austin Powers then. Yeah, yeah. Did you catch the Star Trek reference? No. Deneb Four is the marketplace that he went to. I did catch that. And I was like, that's a Star Trek planet. But I just, they've also talked about Rigel in, in yeah. Avalon 5 before and a few other planets. So, yeah. I felt like Deneb 4 was pretty on the nose. That was Encounter at Farpoint and uh -huh. uh, where Gary Mitchell went in the Where No Man Has Gone Before, the second pilot for the original series. So I thought that was kind of cool. Jeff, you owe me a buzz. Do I? Because the, the show made the reference. I brought it up. You're so. lucky I didn't make you do two for catching Encounter of Farpoint and Gary Mitchell, but whatever. That's fair. That's fair. So we learned some things about these controllers, these keepers or these whatever. Uh-huh. And this one, we learned they have microfibers that hook into the neural system. Uh-huh. That their control over you grows over time uh -huh. as they grow. Uh-huh. They 
mm-hmm. knew who Jack was and found him in the middle of the night. Who, you know, we got to figure out who they are. And then, like you said, they're the starfish. You can't remove them from a body. Well, they grow well back. now I heard that just a smidge different. That someone snuck up on Jack in the middle of the night and planted this on him. Mm-hmm. So whoever snuck up on him in the middle of the night is not the same thing as this thing. Coming, Agreed. coming on him. It's a, it's yeah. a different thing altogether. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's this they yeah. that put this on him, and he said they knew who I was, uh huh, or who I am, or whatever. Right. They knew who I was. But so there's there's a they that we're dealing with, which we, we know I think at this point is dark allies or something like that. Right. It was it was uh what what was that phrase he used in War Without End? Allies and dark minions. Minions. Yeah, the yeah. minions and the out dark allies or whatever it was. Yeah, and so there's the eyeball things. Mm-hmm. which seem to be a thing like a like a its own thing and then whoever these people are who are coming in to uh put them on their shoulder but why haven't we really seen or heard about these folks before now exactly where yeah. were they during the fight and everything that was going on so yeah a lot of questions out of this uh-huh. that we've been seeing i was really i thought i thought the scene played out really well though like i when you know he he shot and it was obvious like he didn't want to and didn't know what he was doing uh-huh. and then he just ran off you yeah. know and then he's on so the... fast though so fast like if you if you weren't paying attention if somebody was like talking to you or the dog barked and you looked over and by the time you looked back at the tv if you if you didn't catch it you'd be lost mm-hmm. so what what everything happened what's this thing that franklin's operating on out of nowhere but he decided he's like this thing really had control over me and there's only one thing i can do uh, I, I thought it was very brave. I thought it was sad, you know, when he's on the train and he's just like, this is what happened. This is what's going on. Mm-hmm. And Hey, I guess I'm going to see how well my tax dollars have been working all this time. But he made one key mistake in everything he did that might have lasting consequences. He gave Dr. Franklin a picture of his 18 year old daughter along with her name and her address. That woman is in serious danger right now. She's been in danger. He's had that picture. No, she's in serious danger because Dr. Franklin has her contact oh, information oh, now. Oh, good call. Oh, good call. Yeah, oh. he was trying to protect her a little bit before. He literally is just like, oh, hi, here. Should have given it to Marcus. Yeah, that would have been the smart move. <laughs> right. I don't know if Child Protective Services is a thing on Mars, but I'm a mandatory reporter and I feel like I need to call somebody. And then the whole thing ends with Marcus doing Franklin a solid and letting him head to the hotel uh, with number one by himself. Nice uh, so being a bro. The, for some reason, they put you in the honeymoon suite. Marcus goes, hey. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Marcus is having fun with that. Come on, darling. Come on, darling. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the only note I guess I really had off that that you didn't mention is, well, a couple things. One, um... The energy in that tube when Jack exploded. Yeah. Okay, first of all, that energy did not seem to completely disintegrate all the debris. So there's debris now in the tube, and this tube does not look like it has a whole bunch of extra space in it. So something's going to have to come through and clean that out before other things come zooming through. But also, that energy had to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, given that it was confined, it, it would have spread very far until it finally dissipated, or it hit something and blew something else up. Glad that it was contained, but like pretty risky move. Well, right. But still, I mean, do those things have, have cow catchers on them? Right. Like trains do like, does it have a deflector dish as it, are they just like through the clear out? Are there people that walk through with a broom, like and sweeping it up or something? Right. You just come through. Oh, look, here's some sunglasses. Somebody dropped. Yeah. You know, um, it's a nice coat, right? I know. Um, the other thing was, uh, Jeff, how do you play I spy? Uh, we usually go with colors. That's how we do. Yeah. I spy with my little eye, something blue, something red, Mm -hmm. something not begins with. I have played it that way before, but in, in our family, and this was an activating scene for me because that is the game. My daughter always wants to play, always wants to play. Oh, I felt Franklin 
to a T on this one. I was like, I am going to punch you if you keep making me play this. Uh huh. I I'm do like, not want to play this anymore. I'm like, I spy someone who's thinking about rolling out of the car while it's moving right now. <laughs> oh, that would be me. <laughs> I say, like, and that's when I shot him, Your Honor. <laughs> yep. I was like, I definitely feel Franklin in this one. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, I felt so bad for him. I will say, though, I did try the first letter one with my daughter the other day. Yeah. And it was a nice change up to the game. It was a really nice change up to the game. So to keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, also, did Marcus really like really did he draw a line down the middle of the room and tell dude stay on your side of the room and we'll stay on ours? He did with boxes. <laughs> Pretend there's a dragon that will eat you if you cross the side of the room. <laughs> oh, man. So Garibaldi. Yeah. So uh, I have a new theory about him. Okay. You want it? I do. Well, it, I, I had the theory and then I destroyed the theory all in the same episode. Because when... Yeah, when he and Sheridan had it out for the first time and then over his shoulder off in the corner, we see those men staring at him mm -hmm. and then they come find him later. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. Is this a ruse? Is Garibaldi and like are Sheridan Garibaldi in on this together? Are they doing something to flush these guys out? Are they, is this, is this Tom Paris and Voyager who's trying to catch the mole who turns out to be Raphael Sabarge giving information to Seska? Is that who this is? And then by the time we got to the end, I was like, no, I don't think that's it either. I think Garibaldi's actually just being, uh, uh, I was going to say something. I can't, this is a family friendly show. I, he's, head. he's being a poopy head. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Cause they, those guys were standing like, so they had their argument yeah. where Sheridan in public was telling Garibaldi to not air his private issues in public. <laughs> which is pretty ridiculous. Right. In fact, Sheridan through almost everything with Garibaldi was ridiculous. He's, he's watching the news thing mm -hmm. and he's just getting angry. And I'm like, this isn't the first time you've seen this. Right. Right. But then I'm like, okay, cool. He's going to go intercept him on his day off. He's going to use his day off to go repair his relationship with Garibaldi. I love this. Go have that talk. But like in a heartbeat, He's like, oh, you don't want to talk? Well, you, you, you're dumb. <laughs> you know, just like you said, they get in that like high school shoving match. And I'm just like, what, what is happening here? Who are these people? But then they clear away and you see those guys in the back. And I'm like, why is Rammstein in this episode? <laughs> <laughs> like no one's going to notice Devo in the back, like wearing right. their leather outfits. Right. It's like, what is this? Right. I, uh, I'm a hundred percent sure that these guys are right from the president's office. He just said this, this is bad for the president mm -hmm. who, who says that. But, uh, the second time around was the big one, you know, where they, they got into the fight. One, my theory is that lady who came up and was like, Oh my God, you're the Sheridan. I think Rammstein sent her like, oh, they, yeah. trying to, you know, push the thing up. But did you catch what Garibaldi said about the Pope? Yeah, he called her a her. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Years ago, when my daughter was very, very young, three, four years old, after mass, my daughter would go up. She's very comfortable in church. And we'd go up into the sanctuary and she would sit on the priest's chair. It's a big thing she wanted to do. To this day, she, uh, you know, she goes to a Catholic school and she's very uh, upset that women cannot be priests. Like that's... Uh, thing that, you know, at eight years old, she's feeling like she wants to do, but she'd go sit in that chair. And one day the priest comes up and I was like, Hey, I keep telling her she's going to need a lot of college before she can think about sitting in that chair. And he's like, yeah. And probably a few more popes too. Mm -hmm. Apparently he's right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, really that's, that's almost all there is. They Rammstein talks to him. He buys into their yeah. stuff and he's okay. signed so, on. So I have two questions. Okay. All right. Because, because both this Garibaldi subplot with these guys, like, like, Hey, you want to join in? We're going to, they never actually said what we're doing. No, not they, all. They, well, they, they did a little bit at the very end. We'll get him the help he needs. 
okay, what does that mean? That seems very euphemistic to me. Yeah, it feels like it feels like to me what we talked about in the illusion of truth uh -huh. of the help he needs. We'll send him to this prison where we sent that director guy That's, and reprogram him. Yes. Um, but maybe this is a bit of my consternation with this episode. I felt the same way about the whole way that the Marcus and Franklin thing ended it ended too. We're going to go meet the resistance, go meet the resistance, go through. Okay. Hey, we verified you guys. Uh, yeah, we've called the other people. It's going to take them three or four days to get here. So let's just go play some poker while we wait. Like it, it never ended. Remember last week, what I said, this episode had a beginning, middle and end. This episode did not feel like it had an end. It didn't and not like only it up at all. And not only did it not have an end, a lot of prestige television that we watch now, today, uh -huh. episodes don't end, but they right. give you a big cliffhanger to bring you. There was no real cliffhanger. No, no. And, and what it was, and the other thing is like everything else in the middle of the episode though, it felt very drawn out. It's like, you didn't just run out of time and have to put this into another episode. It's just, it's like, you didn't have enough episodes. So you started stretching, but then you never went anywhere with it. It just sort of, that might be my consternation with this, with this episode is it just feels incomplete and then drawn out. And that's maybe where I'm saying it's boring. Cause it just, it wasn't tight. It wasn't snappy. I get it. You got to move folks around. You got to move folks around. Uh, here's the other question that I have, Jeff, and I want to pose this to you. Okay. The folks at the resistance that are meeting with Franklin and Marcus, is it possible that those are the same folks who are recruiting Garibaldi? They're from oh, the same wow. organization. You think? I know I don't think, Okay. but I'm putting it out on the table of, as a possibility. Like if you made me put money on it, I would say, no, they're two different groups, but I at least want to throw it out as, as a possibility. Well, you, you, if you play it out, right. What, I mean, there's obvious allusions to Rammstein being part of President Clark's retinue, but we don't know that, you know, I'm, I'm inferring it. So they are there because Sheridan's creating a cult of personality and pulling them away from the mission of Babylon 5 and what it's trying to, uh, to achieve. Look at the resistance group. And you can say the same thing. They're fighting earth because they're more about, but it's, I mean, they're not about Babylon five, but they have that same mission, you know, being, yeah. uh, you know, hope for peace. Maybe, maybe, I think it's a stretch though. I think it'd be I, a I, stretch. I would put it more under the stretch category. I've just, let's just file that away. Mm -hmm. We'll keep it like in the third drawer of the filing cabinet, just in case. That'll have like green yarn instead of the red yarn over on the cork board it's not even gonna get its own push pin we're just gonna sort yeah. of tack it under one of the other push pins yeah it's kind of there with it well brent i think we've reached the point in this conversation for what might i said this earlier but this might be the shortest part of this episode we boil this down to see if there's any star trek like messages in this any deep morals messages holding up a mirror to society anything like that you're gonna do that by rating this episode on a scale of zero to five Delta theories as to how strong that message was and how Babylon five, it was delivered. So lay it on me. Um, Jeff, I've made it no secret. This episode didn't do much for me. Did it have a star Trek quality to it? Was there a message? Did it hold up a mirror to society? Did it do it in a Babylon five way? Not really. I mean, this, like I said, this episode more than any other felt like a, Hey, let's move some chess pieces around and get them set for whatever is getting ready to come. That's going to be totally awesome. It is necessary in a narrative story to put people where they deserve to be. Uh, they did introduce a few new characters. Uh, they introduced these two new groups that people are in like this. I'm not saying that this episode was unimportant and that it, it didn't do anything because it did, mm -hmm. but did it do anything on the sci-fi message? Did it t tell anything to us? And no, I don't think it really did. Giving this one even one Delta Fury would seem to me to be too much. But saying zero just always feels weird to me as well because it's like, oh, this was an awful episode. And I, I, I'm just having a hard time finding much that's redeeming about this episode. So Jeff, I'm gonna do something I don't do very often. I am currently sitting at zero Delta Furies. However, I am not immovable. So I will give you my dear co-host, my good dear co-host, a chance 
were you able to find anything to grab on to okay you like stump stump now i'm going to maintain full control over the choice but do you want to stump for a delta fury or two out of this episode because right now i'm saying zero my struggle and it's how i look at a lot of this star trek message stuff is you know part of my other job and my other podcast is to take sci-fi and other story things and extract leadership lessons from them and teach them. And there are some incredible leadership lessons in this one. Sure. But I think that the one, the one piece I'll, I'll, I'll dig on, on this just a little bit is Ivanova. Mm -hmm. And where I would wanted to go initially with Ivanova was that she forced Sheridan to take care of himself and take time off. But you know, that's just, I mean, that's cool. It's great. That's not a Star Trek message. That's just a good life message for people in general. It also but set I think up Sheridan to be able to go punch fisty cuffs with Garibaldi. Yeah, and punch other things as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> but what she did with the smugglers uh -huh. was incredible because this was a group of people that are used to being painted as the bad guys, the criminal, oh. as the dark, ugly underbelly of society. She didn't see that. What she saw were skills, resources, and abilities. And she's like, how can I bring you together to solve a problem we have? and solve problems you have, right? For the, I, I, I like the part where she's like, look, most of you have open warrants. Like, we'll be there for you and all this stuff blows over if you do this. She went from nothing, hopelessness, two months, eight weeks to starvation, turned it into a massive opportunity, not only for her, but for some people who were disenfranchised before. I thought that was pretty great. I'm not even gonna, postulate as to whether that's worth a Delta yeah. Fury or not, but it's a piece I've got. I, I like it and I would go for it if the show explored it. Mm, if yeah. It discussed it, if it looked at it from a couple of different angles, but it didn't, it just sort if of it was, threw it out there. If it was more than four minutes and if it didn't end with a joke of dude hitting on Ivanova for being a strong and independent person. Yeah. I will tell you, I actually found that rather insulting. The hit like, on piece? Yeah. Like I was sitting there like, there is no dude that I know who ends a meeting like that and has somebody stand up and go, so you dating anybody? Even if it's like a girl, let's, let's say it's a girl or a guy, whatever. Um, you know, they, they stand up and, and like, that doesn't happen to dudes. Like no. the idea that girls have to deal with this. And I it's know sick. that crap like that happens. Yeah. It's disgusting. You know? It's like, really? And I don't want to be a guy who picks on stuff like that, to, that, that over whatever but still i was just like i don't like i was honestly i was thinking of my daughter mm -hmm. and yeah. i was like you know she's gonna deal with people doing like that and you could see it on ivanova's face she was just like really that is not how you woo somebody no woohoo uh jeff i'm giving this one zero delta furies for this week that's fair that's fair well jeff with that uh while ranking this thing according to Delta Furies, we are also creating the absolute 100% completely accurate and definitive ranking of the fourth season of Babylon 5. Jeff, you get to rank this particular episode this week. So where would you place this episode Racing Mars? Our current top five as they stand now from top to bottom are Into the Fire, The Long Night, Atonement, Whatever Happened to Mr. Garibaldi, and The Summoning. Does this one even crack the top five here at episode number 10? This conversation has been helpful because there are some absolute flaws with this episode, but it was a blast. I enjoyed this episode. I'm going to watch it when it comes back on. This is not going to be a skippable episode for me on a rewatch. Like I really dug this episode. Is it top five? Well, Brent, we have some serious heavyweights in the top five. Like we have top five Babylon five episodes in our top five. So it's not going to hit there, but I'll tell you where it is going to land not too far away and it is going to be in our top 10 <laughs> <laughs> as it becomes our new number nine right above epiphanies. Ooh. Okay. I, I am going to put it above epiphanies because I, again, I think it's really important to point out all 10 of these episodes that we have on here are great episodes. Season four has been fantastic. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. That said, Epiphanies, the way it ripped ev all the development away from Bester still just, just chaps me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So this is our new number nine. 
All right. I couldn't argue with you even if I wanted to, because that is really how this, uh, how this thing works. Brent, that's it. These are words you've been waiting to hear for the last hour. That's it for Racing Mars. Next week, we're watching Lines of Communication for the first time. We've never seen these episodes before. We don't look at thumbnails, anything else. This is our fun prediction game where we guess what the next episode is going to be based on title alone, just to quiet those people out there who did not hear us the first time we said it. There have been two of the movies that came right before this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not watching them in the chronological order of the of the timeline of Babylon 5. We're watching those afterwards. So we're going to just watch the next episode in line, which is Lines of Communication. Yes. Brent, what do you think that's going to be about? Well, I I think we get more Franklin and Marcus on Mars. We meet the other rest of the resistance folks. Lines of communication. Uh, communication has been cut off between Babylon 5 and Earth. It has also been cut off between Mars and Earth outside of ISN. So I'm going to go with this is where we open up lines of communication between Mars and Babylon 5, okay. bypassing the jam that Earth is putting on everything. What about you? I think that for real this time, we're going to get some of the Garibaldi stuff. We're going to learn about the lines of communication connecting him to Psychor or whomever programmed him mm -hmm. and how that's been working. I think that's going to be a dig into these Rammstein guys and, and stuff like that. And I think that because we saw that controller thing, and we got a little bit of insight into it. Now we're going to start finally getting some of the Centauri stuff coming up and out of it. We're going to find out right here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate it so much. Please subscribe wherever you're viewing or watching. Leave us a rating, a review. I'll read it here on the podcast. And please hit that share button. Share button on YouTube, the share button in whatever podcast app you're listening to. And share this with somebody who loves Babylon 5 who you're trying to help fall in love with Babylon 5, or someone who just needs to listen to two guys talk about a 30-year-old TV show. It would mean the world to us if you pass this along. So until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, what's up? Um, You know, I heard you last night. Yeah? What? Who? Who? In Valen's name. <laughs>
I love them. I mean, those are the movies that were on Mystery Science Theater 3000 without the commentary. Yeah, they were just they were put on there legit. You had Gilbert or Rhonda if it was Friday or Saturday night uh-huh. coming in between to kind of make little little jabs and little things at him. But I mean, they were they were Tromi the Tromeo films, right? Uh-huh. The, the the oh my god, a Tromeo, trauma, trauma. But I think a Tromeo and Juliet. I love those things. So I mean, I I definitely have a flair for the suck. Mm-hmm. And this this was kind of a you know in a way this reminded me of season one Babylon Five. Mm-hmm. You know, just like random ca- Captain Jack is a random overacting character coming in, and number two, God, that guy's awful. Hey, do you want to hear my turkey thing? Since we're here, sure. I might have, I might have shared this last year. I don't remember. Uh-huh. But Brent, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. This will be the greatest turkey you've ever eaten in your life, and I I want people out there to try this and and like write back and, and tell us all about it. So club 65 exclusive right here, right here. Club 65 cooking tips from Jeff Aiken. In fact, I got to pull up my <laughs> other, uh, <laughs> you know where I'm going. So I'll hit this after, uh, after my thing. So any Turkey that weighs 21 pounds or less, this will work on. And if it's bigger than 21 pounds, just add a little bit of time. This is the two hour Turkey recipe. You get your Turkey thought, clean it, all that stuff. Don't do anything, you know, clean it out, get all the, the stuff out of it if it's in you know the package or whatever. So you clean it, let it thaw, and then you put so much mayonnaise on that turkey that you are personally disgusted. Like on the outside of it? Yeah, coat it. Just layers and layers of gross, okay. lathered mayonnaise. And ju- I mean, when I first started doing this, I would season it. Like I'd put garlic or pepper or stuff in the mayonnaise. Don't, you're wasting your time. So just put all this in there. Preheat your oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Slap the turkey in there. 30 minutes, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. At 30 minutes, you drop it down to 350, and you let that run for an hour and a half. Two hours total. You pull it out. It's beautiful. It's so good. Because at that 500 degree, that 30-minute piece, it turns the mayonnaise into a shell and then it basically superheats the turkey, and there's nowhere for the juices to go. It's all sealed in. It's amazing. It's amazing you say that about mayonnaise because one of the reasons in cooking to use mayonnaise, or at least that I use mayonnaise, is I'll put it on. I'll put a thin layer on bread. Um, like if I'm making like a ham sandwich or something, I'll put it in there to prevent the bread from getting soggy if it's got to sit in the lunchbox for a while. Mm, yeah, yep. because that mayonnaise actually creates a a, a moisture barrier. Yep, like a uh, shell almost. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you say that. Like, so uh, just remember, if Yen can cook, so, so can you, Jogi. What color is the bird when it comes out? Does it all like melt off and become transparent? And it's just no, it, 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 it shells on it, so it turns like it, it. When you first open it, you might be a little alarmed because there's little like if you have big chunks of mayonnaise, it'll actually burn, like it'll char okay a little bit. But then it's got kind of this reddish hue to it. But the skin, like that comes off, it's delicious. It's crispy. It's so good. And then like even the white meat and the breast, it's so juicy. It's so good. Huh. Okay. I've been and doing that recipe. It. Uh, like, do nope. you taste the mayonnaise when you're nope. when you're eating? You taste turkey. And that's and here's the thing. I say you taste turkey. You're like, turkey has no flavor. Yeah, because people smoke it or deep fry it or roast it. Yeah. And you do those things, you might taste a little smoke. You might taste a little of the fry, but turkey doesn't taste like anything. It sure does if the flavor has nowhere to escape. Interesting. It's good. It's really You don't have all good. that water in the bottom of the bag or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You got to put it in a bag? Nope. No, oh. it's nothing. I literally uh, like, literally, I just have this like roasting pan uh-huh. that I drop it in, slather, 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 put it in the oven, take it out. I let it rest, you know, for a good 20, 30 minutes, but that's just, that's the barbecue guy in me who is always letting meat rest, carve into it. Oh, it's perfect. Hmm. All right. Well, there you go. Club 65. Hey, make Good sure you get you. your gear. Exclusively bit.ly dot or bit dot L Y slash B five club 65. Uh, you guys drop a 65 down in the comments. Let us know that you are here. Remember outside of club 65, we don't talk about club 65. 
If they know, they know. If they don't, they don't. Tell them, don't, don't tell people what this is. They got to discover nope. it for themselves. You're here for a reason. You're yeah. here. You're here. Don't don't give this away. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the more the merrier, I say as well. So anyway, yeah. with that, Jeff, let's go ahead and get out of here for today. And I might try to go watch the next episode because hopefully it's actually a good episode. Oh, it will be, despite will what be. you said. All right, bye, guys. <laughs>